Are you ready to read God's word today, church? God has a message for you. He has a message for me. Before I come here and preach to you, he has, he always speaks to me first. So I pray that you came ready. I pray that you came here expecting to grow, expecting to be challenged. And and if you know me, it doesn't take very long. Hopefully, it doesn't take very long to know that I am a Jesus guy. I'm all about Jesus. I love this, the person of, of Jesus Christ. And it, it doesn't, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what everyone else says. It really doesn't matter what people are posting. It doesn't matter what politics are saying because politics don't have the final word. What Jesus says is the final word, amen? And so his word is final. If you believe that this is God's word, we believe that this is his final word. And so everything will pass away. Everything that we know will pass away. But the word of the Lord will remain forever. So let's open our ears today so that we can hear God's word and that he can change us and mold us into the person he's created us to be. Let's take this moment as you hold your Bible, uh, maybe you're using uh, sermon notes on our app or you're using your phone to read God's word. Let's hold it in our hands and let's pray, thanking God for allowing us, for enabling us to understand, to read, to comprehend his word. Just say a prayer to God, thanking him. God, thank you for your word. Use your own words. It doesn't have to be fancy. We learned that last week. We don't have to be fancy with our words. Just speak to him, thanking him. Lord God, we are so thankful that your word is alive. It's a double-edged sword. It pierces our spirit. It has the, the capacity, the power to, to separate spirit and soul and and it has the power to change us, to mold us, to convict us of any sin, anything that we need to change. So Lord, we pray that your spirit can, can do a mighty work here today. For those of us here present physically, for those of us at home watching, even after this sermon is preached, those who will be listening in on the podcast, Lord God, we pray that you can do a mighty work Use me as a vessel in your hand. We love you, God. God, We pray this in Jesus' name. And the church said, amen. So when you were a kid, did you, did you collect stuff? Did you collect stuff? What's that? I'm sorry, what? Well, yeah, well, yeah. Um, but as a kid, as a kid, what, what sort of things do you, or do you collect? What kind of things? Just shout it out. Shells, okay, what else? As a kid. Pogs, yes, I love pogs. If you don't know what pog is, you have to Google it. Oh, you're missing out, Caroline. It's so amazing. Pogs, yes, what else? Hot Wheel cars, I did that. Anyone else? Barbies, okay. Um, Pokemon cards, anyone? Yes, I had a whole binder, the holographic ones, right? Um, how about those uh, jelly roll pens? Remember those? Uh, the Lisa Frank stuff, those, those binders and, and folders with the, the glittery stuff. Uh, trolls. Remember those trolls? Slap bracelets? Posters of your favorite band that was low with NSYNC? You go into her room and it'll be all NSYNC. When I was a kid, I used to collect pennies. And I didn't even like use it to buy anything. I just collected pennies. See, I loved watching Aladdin and the Goonies because I love the, the treasure scenes when they were in 
like on the ship and there's all this treasure. And when Aladdin was in the cave and there's all this treasure. And so I would spread out all my pennies and I would separate the, the shiniest ones. And I would hold them in my hand and pretend that it's gold. Like, ah, oh, I found the treasure. Now, do you collect anything now as an adult? Maybe you do. I, I personally, I collect Toy Story toys. Now, I've told myself, it's not for me, it's for Melody when she gets older, okay? Um, I collect comics, I love comics. Again, it's for Melody when she gets older, okay? I just have to read them to make sure they're good for her to read later. Um, But people collect everything, right? People collect bottle caps and playing cards and stamps and video games, books and jewelry, shoes, guns, model cars, art, teddy bears, salt and pepper shakers, and the list can go on. But some people take it way too far. There's some weird stuff that people collect, like Pez dispensers or AOL CDs or even lint. People collect lint or celebrity hair. And that's just weird, right? And if you do that here, I'm going to pray over your life, okay? To collecting, for some people, collecting becomes their life, right? It's way too much. And, and sometimes it could be a spiritual issue, like, like hoarders, like people who just, you go into their house and they just have so much stuff and they just hoard everything because they find worth in their possessions. See, this needs to be addressed. When life, when life becomes an accumulation of things, it's tough to make sense of life. Because what happens when you lose it all? Did you see the aftermath? Did, did you Google any pictures of the aftermath of Hurricane Laura? I mean, I, I did, and it's so sad. I mean, these houses are completely flattened. And uh, the, the organization that I love, Samaritan's Purse, they're already on it. They're, they're helping, they're serving, they're doing what they can to help these people. See, when we lose everything, do we still find purpose? When, when we lose loved ones, Can we still find purpose? 2020 has been really challenging us in this way, right? I mean, death of family, death of friends, deaths of of, of loved celebrities. Jesus preached about collecting things. And he used a word that kind of encapsulates everything, that encompasses everything to describe it all. He uses the word treasure. As a kid... My pile of pennies, that was my treasure. But I have to ask myself now, what do I treasure currently? What do I treasure most? And Jesus, he tells us there are two types of treasures. He tells us which treasure is the best, and then he gives us three things to consider. And really, he wants to convince us to choose the best treasure. And so the title of today's sermon is treasures beyond the grave. Treasures beyond the grave, the kind of treasure that lasts forever. So let's hear Jesus out. If you want to open to Matthew chapter 6 with me. Matthew chapter 6. I have the sermon notes on our app. If you want to install that, you can just search Pure Word Church on your app store or Play Store, and you can click on sermon notes. You can fill in the blanks, follow along on there. We're going to start in verse 19. Matthew 6, 19. If you have it, say amen. Amen. All right. He says this, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. So what are the two types of of treasures, treasures on earth, and treasures in where? Heaven, okay? Earth and heaven. Here's the thing. Jesus wants the best for us. He, he, he's telling us, don't settle for pennies, okay? Don't settle for, for shells. 
don't settle for Pokemon cards and the things that we treasure here on earth. He wants us to collect treasure that goes beyond our grave. So Jesus puts them up against each other and he lets us decide for ourselves. We need to make a choice. Which kind of treasure will we store up? But why is it important to make this choice? And he tells us in verse 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In the Bible, many times when the Bible mentions heart, it's not really talking about the organ. It's talking about our total being. It's talking about what makes us tick, who we are. And so what he's saying is your total being is found wherever your heart is. Whatever you treasure, whatever you value the most in this life, that's really where your total being, where your heart is. Jesus hits three very important areas of back then the Jewish culture, but I think it relates to us today too. He, he, he talks about clothing, food, and jewelry. Like I, I didn't read that, Pastor Tim. Where does he say clothing, food, and jewelry? Well, we can uh, investigate what he's talking about. Moths destroy clothes. And then he says rust. The word here, rust, literally means eating. So it's like worms eating our food. And then thieves, they usually steal jewelry. And so back then, that's what uh, the Jewish culture, that's what they prized. This was very important for them, clothing, food, and jewelry. But first, I want to talk about what Jesus is not saying. Jesus is not saying that it's wrong to have things. Because there are some Christians who believe, like, you can't have nice things. They'll go to Costco and they'll see that TV and they're like, you know what? I would love to have that TV, but I'm a Christian. I can't do it. That's not what Jesus is saying. He is not saying that saving for a rainy day is sinful. He's not saying that getting life insurance is an unwise thing. It's actually a wise thing to do. The Bible gives us the ant as an example, right? Because the ant collects during the summer. Collect and storing for a rainy day. And Paul even tells Timothy that if you don't provide for your family, you're worse than an unbeliever. So it's okay to have nice things. And it's also not wrong to enjoy your possessions and your money. It's okay to enjoy your car. It's okay to enjoy your motorcycle, okay? It's okay to enjoy good foods, your home, to enjoy a good vacation, enjoy life, right? Melinda and I like to say, treat yourself. Sometimes you just need to treat yourself. What Jesus is forbidding is greed. What Jesus is forbidding and saying not to do is accumulating things for the sake of accumulating and finding worth in that. In Luke 12, 15, in a New Living Translation, Jesus said this, Beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Jesus is talking about those people who are only satisfied by things in the world. People whose ambitions and their passions and their interests point to things here on earth. I'll give you an example. It's not sinful to buy a home. But when your home is all you think about, when your home is all you talk about, how every conversation is about the furniture we need to get and the remodeling that needs to be done and and, and how this and this needs to be changed. Well, I saw on HDTV that they use shiplap and I need shiplap or else I won't be happy. That becomes your treasure here on earth. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing to have children. I absolutely love Melody. I feel like every second that goes by, I'm just looking at her and I'm like, "How I did not know I could love a child as much as this. But there are some people who put their children before their spouse when really your spouse is number one. Some other parents, their children is their world. Commentator Ken Hughes, he says it like this, it's a form of narcissism and selfishness. 
the kind of parent that they don't have any time for neighbors, they don't have any time for the community, they don't have any time for church because my children is my world, this is my treasure. Those kinds of parents are, are setting themselves up for a lot of hurt and pain in the future. Your child is not your world. Your child is not perfect. When people say that something is their everything, like, oh, this is my everything. This is my world. I cringe. I, I know what they're saying, but really the words that they're using, how something is their everything, their world. I mean, their total being is defined by their treasure. It could be your car. It could be your motorcycle. You put so much time and in, in money and you're invested in it. This is my world. Be careful with that. Commentator, theologian Kent Hughes, he talks about a rich hoarder um, who was on his deathbed. He had a lot of stuff, and, and so he called a doctor, he called his lawyer, and he called his minister, and he told him, hey, listen, I'm about to go, all right? My time is, is about to end. I'm going to die soon. And I know what they say. You can't take anything with you, but I'm going to try. Okay, so I'm going to give each of you an envelope, and in that envelope, there's $30,000 cash. So I want for each of you, as my casket is lowering down to the ground, throw in the envelope. Okay, that's what I want you to do. So when the time came, the man passed away, it was his funeral, the casket was lowering down, and so they tossed down, tossed in the envelope. But on the way home, the minister spoke to the doctor and the lawyer and said, hey, hey guys, I, I have to confess something. I, I really needed the money for church. So I took out 10000 and I actually only threw in 20000 into the grave. The doctor said, you know what? I, I also got a sense you're confessing. I'm going to confess too. I, I'm building a clinic. And so I actually took 20000 and I only put in 10000 I'm sorry. I just, I just had to do it. The lawyer said, gentlemen, I'm ashamed of you. See, I threw in a personal check for the full amount. Treasures on earth don't last forever. Like, well, Tim, I make sure my car and my motorcycle last a lifetime. You can't take it with you. You can't take it with you. So what are these treasures in heaven? We don't really know. We don't really know. The Bible is not really clear about it. But looking at the whole scope of scripture, it could be, it could be, based on what Paul has been saying, it could be the people that we've led to Jesus or the people that we've taken a part of leading to Jesus because that's eternal, right? When we tell someone about Jesus or when we invite them to church or when we invest in a church and the gospel gets spread and people come to Jesus, when we, when we see Jesus face to face and we see those people there, that enough, that's a reward in itself. That's eternal because these people are living forever because you help them out. You told them about Jesus. First Thessalonians 2.19, this is what Paul says, for what is our hope or joy, or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming, is it not you? So Paul is talking to the church and saying, man, when I see Jesus Christ, my crown, my reward, the thing that I'm going to boast about, it's not going to be my bow or my car or the things that I have. It's going to be you. I'm going to boast about the church that I was leading, the people that I was helping out in the spiritual journey. And theologian John Stott, he says it could be new, numerous benefits right now. It could be the development of our Christ-like character. It could be the increase of our faith and hope and charity. It can be using our money for the sake of Jesus. It can be investing now so that we can help spread the gospel. And so here's the first benefit of choosing to store up treasures in heaven. If you're writing down notes in our app, here's the first fill in the blank. The first benefit is this. It lasts forever. It lasts forever, but it all depends where your heart is. So a good question to ask yourself is, where is my heart? Is it on the paint color for your new home? See, because I think about this. When we live in eternity with Jesus, 
How much will that scratch on your car matter? People will get bent out of shape about spilling a drink on their white carpet. First of all, why white? I don't know, but how much will your white carpet matter trillions of years from now when you're with Jesus? How much of all of that will matter? Jesus is saying, invest and store up treasures in heaven because they last forever. And, and actually, here's a phrase that I wrote that sums it up. Don't settle for a life that has no purpose beyond your grave. Church, don't settle for a life that has no purpose beyond your grave. And we have um, a picture that goes with this phrase, if you want to put that up, please. Don't settle for a life that has no purpose beyond your grave. You can do so much, so much through Jesus, church. You can do so much more than choosing furniture. You can do so much more than collecting shells and Pokemon cards. You can do so much by finding your purpose in something else other than things that don't last. Finding your purpose in things that last. So that's his first argument. Treasures in heaven last forever. Now just, just, for, a, just for a side note, you can continue collecting your Pokemon cards, okay? And your shells. But where is your heart? Matthew 6, 22 to 23. Jesus is saying, the eye is the lamp of the body, so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? I want to show you something. This right here is one of the cameras that we use for our business. We shoot commercial things with this, wedding films with this, great quality, works well, beautiful images and video. So here's a little, this is called a DSLR camera, right? Here's a little uh, DSLR one-on-one -on -one for you. You can have a great, this is called a camera body, okay? Camera body. You can have a great camera body, but if you don't have a good lens, the camera is subpar. So I just put so I just put on lens and this is the lens that came with the camera. It's not the best lens that you can have. It's okay. But when you have cheaper lens, the body won't achieve its full potential. So it's worth getting a nicer lens. This is a nicer lens. It's worth getting a nicer lens because then the camera body will produce better videos, will produce better images, and that's really what changes everything. But even, even if you have the best lens in the market, if you dirty up this lens, all of your images and video will look horrible. You need to keep it clean, okay? That's DSLR, photography video, one on one, okay? God has created all of us like a camera body. So much potential. Able to display beautiful images. But some of us have settled for cheap lens. Why? Because it's easier. It's less money, it's easier to get, get to, it kind of comes with the whole package. So everything that we see through these cheap lens, 
won't look as good. I read a story about an unhappy king and uh, he called his, his wise men to help with his unhappiness. And, and so the, the wise men were thinking, how can we make this king happy? And so they thought, they came up with a plan. If we find a man that is happy and the king wears this man's shirt, the king will also be happy. So the king thought, hey, this is a great idea. I'm going to send you out to find a happy man. And so this, these wise men went out into the land and looked for a happy man. And they looked and looked and looked. And it was, they almost gave up because it was really difficult. But they finally found a happy man. But there was one problem. He had no shirt. See, when our eyes are fixed on finding happiness in the world, things, sin, then life itself doesn't make sense. See, an impaired spiritual vision will distort everything you know. An impaired spiritual vision will distort everything you know. And, and I don't know why God put this in my heart at the time of writing the sermon, but I just want to speak. I don't think um, there really are any, uh, well, there could be watching and hear uh, many single women listening. I want to speak to you really quickly. As a, a pastor... As your brother, don't settle for cheap lens. Don't settle for cheap lens. Find a man that respects you. Find a man that respects you and your body, a man that treasures and values you for you, a man that doesn't value you based on your looks, but values you, values you based on what's inside. It's worth waiting and being patient for great lens for someone who will help you see life to its fullest potential. It's a tragedy that there are women who have been blinded, blinded by society and what they're meant to look like, blinded by a trauma in their childhood. So they see everything in their life through those lens. And that's just one example. The same goes for men. Your past, your tragedy, your sin, hear me out, does not define you. Jesus gives you a brand new start. So you don't have to look at life in the lens of your sin, in the lens of your tragedy, in the lens of what society says you should be like. And this pattern is found everywhere. everywhere. I mean, look at celebrities. They can, they can have everything they ever wanted, but many of them are miserable and they're bored and they're unhappy. Jesus is telling us to store up treasures in heaven because they last forever, but also here's the second one, it gives us a clear vision of life. It gives us a clear vision of life. It gives us purpose and meaning. Our identity and our joy doesn't rise and fall with our bank account or amount of new stuff that we have. So here's a question we can ask ourselves for this point. What are my eyes fixed on? Where's my heart? What are my eyes fixed on? Don't settle for a life that has no purpose beyond your grave. So Jesus tells us one more thing to consider. Verse 24. No one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to, to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You cannot serve God and money. Jesus is giving us an absolute truth here. No one can serve both God and money. It's impossible. You will fail if you try. Oh, well, Pastor Tim, I disagree. I can serve God and money. Same reason why I can have two jobs and two employers. See, that's not how it works because God is not our employer. He's our owner. Paul says in Romans 6.22, but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end eternal life. When we become Christians, we become slaves of God. Now, we don't like that word slave because it carries with it a, a, a lot of negative connotations. But to be a slave of God, a slave to God, is the best thing imaginable. It leads to eternal life. It makes you a better person. We live forever. But you can't be a slave to God and to money. And that is why debt is so very dangerous. 
Because when you're in debt and money is tight, money talks. Did you know that money talks to you? Did you know that money talks to you? Maybe you don't believe me, but I saw a pastor demonstrate it and I never forgot it. And I want to demonstrate to you right now how money can talk. So let's just say it's after church service, you're mingling and talking to people and you're drinking your bottle of water and then someone, you know, they, they finished your drink and they, they just tossed their bottle on the ground. Now, how dare they do that, right? Horrible. But let's just say they do. No one is going to look at that bottle and think, gee, I can sure use that bottle. I could do so many, I can reuse it. I can fill in water in there and I can, oh. The best case is someone picks it up and throws it away, but even that's stretching it, right? No one is going to be doing that. No one's going to be doing that. But let's just say someone drops a $20 bill. Now the situation has changed. Because now you're no longer thinking to yourself, the $20 bill begins to talk to you. Hey, psst, I'm over here. Do you see me? Yes, I do. I see you all there, nice and green, lonely and unused. That's right. You need me, don't you? You know what? Not that you, not, not, not that you say that, I sure do. You work so hard to pay your bills. You could use $20 of fun money in your budget. You know what? Yeah, I can. You know, Dave Ramsey did say to go gazelle and tense with your debt. I can help you. Just pick me up. So what do you do? You step on it. Yeah, you know, just mingling with people, talking, and then once everyone leaves... You pick it up, put it in your pocket. You cannot serve both God and money. Because you can serve God on Sundays and then money on weekdays. You can serve God with your lips and then money with your heart. You can serve God 50% and money the other 50%, but money will then become your God. And so here's the third benefit of choosing to store up treasures in heaven it is worth so much more. It is worth so much more. God is a jealous God, and he does not share his glory. It's Jesus or nothing. And so a good question to ask ourselves here is, who am I serving? Where is my heart? What are my eyes fixed on? And who am I serving? Don't settle for a life that has no purpose beyond your grave. Now, I recently preached a sermon on the rest of the chapter about worry and about anxiety. And so you can listen to that on our website. But Jesus says to not worry about anything. And now it makes more sense when you get the whole chapter. Seeking God's kingdom first results in eternal treasure. Now, church, our life is so short. It's a tragedy what happened to Chadwick Boseman, dying at 43, peak of his life, huge role in Marvel movies. It makes you ponder. It makes you think and analyze your life. Tomorrow is not guaranteed. And I think that's why Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes 7.2 in the New Living Translation, better to spend your time at funerals than at parties. After all, everyone dies, so the living should take this to heart. His point is this, at parties, you're not thinking of consequences, you're not thinking of what you value, you're not thinking of your future. But when you are reminded that life is short, Hopefully, it will make you ask the question, where's, where's my heart? What are my eyes fixed on? Who am I serving? 
Now, can we ask ourselves those questions right now? I, I just want to do a little something different today. I'm going to spend a few minutes just pondering. So you can just have your eyes open or you can close them. Just don't fall asleep. You can close them if that makes it easier for you to think real deeply. But I'm just going to ask you a few questions. I just want you to dig deep into your heart. And ask God to reveal some things that maybe you're, you're hiding down there. First question is, where is my heart? Where is my heart? This pandemic could have messed up with your finances. It could have messed up with your job, making things more difficult. Issues with health, your plans have been disrupted. Theologian Ken Hughes, he, he wrote some good questions. I'm going to just read them to you. What occupies my thoughts when I have nothing else to do? Is it my investments, my position, my job, bills? If so, those are the things I treasure and that is where my heart really is. What is it that I fret about most? Is it my home or perhaps my clothes? Is it remodeling? Is it politics? If so, then I know where my treasure lies. Apart from my loved ones, what or whom do I most dread losing? And what is it that I know I cannot be happy without? The other question is, what are my eyes fixed on? Are my spiritual eyes healthy? Do I view the Bible as God's supreme authority or something I can pick and choose to follow? Do I see God when things are good and bad? Am I relying too much on things other than God to find happiness or joy? And the last one, who am I serving? Am I serving God 100%? Do I serve God only on Sundays or the whole week? Do I fully trust God? Do I fully trust that God will provide if I give him my tithe? Or am I holding back on giving because I'm afraid I won't make ends meet? Am I 100% committed to making Jesus famous? Am I looking for opportunities to tell people about Jesus and invite them to church? If you've been closing your eyes, you can open them. And remember, don't settle for a life that has no purpose beyond your grave. Church, imagine what God could do through us if we were all in for Jesus. Well, Tim, Pastor can, do, but Pastor Tim, God can do anything, can He? Yes, He can. He can save lives and He can change them, but He has chosen to do all those things through us. It's just the way He's chosen to do things. So if our heart is in the wrong place, if our eyes are fixed on the wrong thing, and if we're not serving God with all of our life, then we're missing out on seeing what God can really do through us. Imagine the people that we can bring to Jesus. People that you never thought would step into a church. People that you never imagined would get baptized in water. So church, let's be creative. Let's be creative and think of things that we can do to take the church to where people are. Let's think of events. Come up to me with, with ideas and let's put it to practice. Things that we can invite people to. Bringing a church to them. I mean, example we do at Joey and Rita's house, we did uh, last year, was movie night. It's a great example of storing your treasures in heaven, using your passions, using the things that you have, that you possess to bring people to Jesus. Finding opportunities to speak about God wherever we are. Church, let's use social media to spread the gospel. I love sharing memes and funny things, but let's bring life into people. Let me tell you, people, they are hungry for the truth today. They are tired of Christians who are, are, are hiding and afraid to speak the truth. Believe it or not, they want the truth. Let's invest our time and money on things that will go beyond our grave so that when Jesus does return, part of our reward will be a line of people who will live forever because you valued the best treasure 
the treasure that goes beyond your grave. So listen, don't think for one second that you can't influence the people at your job, that you can't influence the people at your school, that you can't make a difference. You can. Doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are, what race you are. In Jesus, we are one. And he has chosen you. He has called you out to live for him and to store up treasures in heaven. And let me tell you, you may not get a pat on the back. No one may have looked on the good thing that you're doing and striving for Jesus. But when Jesus sees you, when you face him, you will see the treasures that will last forever. Church, don't settle for a life that has no purpose beyond your grave. Let's close our eyes and bow our heads. And let's ask God to use us to get us out of our comfort zone and be the people that God has called us to be. The word church in the Greek, it's ekklesia. It literally means called out ones. We're not meant to be in a building. We are meant to go out and spread the gospel to store up treasures in heaven. Say a prayer right where you are. If you're watching online, say a prayer. God, use me right now. Use me to be an influence in people, the people in my life, the people I work with, friends at school, my teachers, my boss, my clients. Lord, we need you more than ever right now. Because just going to church, just showing up is not enough. Help us to remember that going to a Sunday service is not enough. And it helps us and and it builds us up. But Lord, help us so that we can view this time here on Sundays as a, a briefing room, as a pep talk. So that when we go out into the world, Lord, we can store up treasures in heaven and not think about the worldly possessions that we have and and trying to accumulate those things. Help us change our hearts so that we can store up treasures in heaven, things that last forever. That we can invest our time and our money and our sweat and tears on things that will last forever. Lord, give us ideas. Help us be creative on ways that we can spread your gospel ways that we can preach your word to other people. Help us to be bold, even on social media. In love, let us speak the truth. In love, let us not stand down on the things that we need to say, and the things that we need to do. But Lord, we can only do this through your spirit. We can only do this through your strength. And Paul said that I can do all things through Christ. And so we can do this, but we need you. Lord, we want to step into your boat. We want to learn how to sleep in that boat. So help us right now, Lord God. We pray this in Jesus' name. And the church said, amen, amen.